Hey everybody, it's Devin. And it's Kate. And this is finally working. You're damn right it is. Welcome to Med Crimes. <laughs> So, Kate and I have been screwing around. The reason why I said this is finally working, we're playing with our audio. Yeah, the audio has been a problem. We we're know really sorry. it's not awesome. No. We, we're getting there, though. We have established this week, though, a production team. Yes, like, we have. it's now more than just a party of Devin and Kate. Yeah. So, we have a production team, mm-hmm. and they're getting together this weekend, mm-hmm. and we're going we're gonna to fix it. We're going to, we're going to, it's going to be good. It, it's going to be good. And um, also, we're. This, Go ahead. Thankful that um, we have one working microphone yeah. set up because we're like snuggling a little we're bit. We're not right social now. distancing. We are not. <laughs> Thankfully, we're essentially in the same germ pool and yes, we're vaccinated and all that good stuff. So it's great. It's good stuff. So I think with the with the addition of a production team, it's now taken us from the amateur level to like the the not so amateur pro level? amateur level like like the <laughs> mediocre level mediocre that's what we're really hoping for hey. no but for in all serious though like we um love our listeners and we love 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 our patreons and we want to make sure we bring you the quality yes of audio not that just you guys the good deserve. not just the good content yeah. but we want you to enjoy listening to it yeah, and exactly not, and i've list- listened to you know i've listened to podcasts that are like the production yeah. value isn't great and it is very distracting right and it, it's and not enjoyable like, experience yeah. and then you've got your headphones or your airpods mm-hmm. in and you're like oh you're like well that didn't sound my great. ears people so we're really sorry about that and we and it, we literally like just spent a bunch of time just playing with everything and try to get it to work but ultimately we just decided to you know, kind until of snuggle pro- and use until the production one mic. fixes it. Yeah, production. We're 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 snuggling with the one microphone. We are. <laughs> we have business. So we had another awesome week. We, we had another awesome week. Some yes. more reviews came in. Yeah. We got more Patreons. 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 All right, so let's start off. Um, our first Patreon is Whitney Birchfield. Whitney Birchfield. Hey, Whitney. Hey, girl. Hi. What's up? Thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, am I doing all of them? Yes. Oh, you're okay. do- oh I'm doing all of them. Yeah. Dave Grout. Dave Grout. Dave Grout. You're the man, Dave Grout. Thank you. Thank you. Charissa Zavarotny. Charissa Zavarotny. Charissa. Oh, I just. Ah. Wow. Charissa Cha Cha Zavarotny. And last but certainly not least, Amy Simmons. Amy Simmons. Shout out to Amy. You guys Old school. are amazing. We're just going to say it. Amy, shout out to you, old school nursing oh, hell yeah. slash sweet mate. We all lived together in our suite at college at one point, and it was awesome. That's a whole nother podcast. Yeah, <laughs> it is. There were adventures were had in this room. So you guys, we are so incredibly grateful for this response, and we, we are so touched beyond um, any words at your contributions absolutely it's amazing and you guys and that's again why we're just we're stepping up the the sound quality game you guys you guys are giving us such good feedback you guys are letting us do that and such good support that we're just that's it we're done screwing around we're done screwing around done screwing around we're doing it right we wanted to um also just take a moment and just say that we're both like really heartbroken uh, and taken aback by what's going on in ukraine and so much shit in the world. It's obviously all anybody is talking about and thinking about right now, and that's no exception for us. Nope. And nope. if you're, you know, from Ukraine or have family in Ukraine or you're in Ukraine, I know we've had some people listen from Ukraine. Oh, have we? We have. So Whoa. we we're love you guys. you guys. We're we thinking you. of you. We're we're so so sorry that this is happening. And of course, I wish I knew more about like the political side. Brad is really good about like explaining all of like the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the details. David and, stuff. and I have had a lot of talks about it. This so week. it's you know really just just I can't even imagine I hope being in that ends, situation. I hope it ends soon, and I hope it ends 
more peacefully than what is happening right yes, now. Yes, this is this is and just mind boggling. And I think to add the other heartbreaking thing that we've brought up um, a few episodes ago is Harmony Montgomery. That's right. There still has not been any new developments, um, and I think the story first broke in November. Yes, November, it did. December, they have not found and this girl. They have not found her, and really, they have no new leads. No. Nope. Um, you know, so it's just you know our hearts are still with that, and yeah, that's it's sort of like died down in the media but i feel like a lot of people are still asking about it and thinking about I it i sure hope so and i do know that the state of new hampshire is now doing a lot of work internally about looking into the process by which you know she was on the radar of the family services right and somehow she was not reported missing for two years right and um, um, but I don't, you know, there's probably a lot of things about like oh, there's a lot that we don't know how it sure. didn't get caught and all that stuff. But just like everything else that we talk about in nursing, I'm sure over the last several years, DCYF is strapped as oh, well. And of course. when you don't give everybody the the staffing and the and every, the support that they need, unfortunately, things do fall through. This the cracks. is what happens. And yeah, so it's and to no fault of anyone, no whatsoever. Yep. So all right, yeah. That's without enough further of those ado, things. well. I will say this. Um, one of our Patreons sent me like this sweet little polite message about, you know, I work in the pharmacy industry and I would love to hear something about a pharmacist or a pharmaceutical tech. And, and you know what? What our Patreons want, they get, baby. What our Patreons want, they get. Yeah. So I'm going to talk today about Robert Courtney, who is an American former pharmacist from Kansas City, Missouri. He intentionally diluted over 98,000 drug vials and bags of many different types Stop. before dispensing them to patients Stop. and clinics. Yeah, 98,000. Isn't that insane? Wow. So let's explain this for the people that, you know, again, that might be listening that are, aren't medical. So this is a pharmacist working in a pharmacy yeah. who's prepping the medication to be given either as inpatient or outpatient? Is this guy an the inpatient? Primary, the, his specialty was mixing chemo for okay. a neighboring oncology practice. Okay, so who probably... Who did inpatient and outpatient chemo yes. infusions. So he's doing things on the other side, in the mm -hmm. back, yep. you know, prepping the meds so mm -hmm. that, you know, they can be administered by the nurses. Yep. And, and we're going to talk about all the mechanisms that he used and the, the, you know, technical aspect behind it and why he did it. But it's all, you know, very, very uh, mind blowing what he did and the scale that he was able to do it. 98,000? 98,000. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, Robert Ray Courtney was born September 15th, 1952, in Hayes, Kansas. His father was a traveling minister who was based in Scott City, Kansas, which was a neighboring town. I I couldn't find a whole lot about his family and his upbringing. I don't know a lot about his mom or anything, really. There was really no information to be found about his mother. Um, mm -hmm. By all accounts, he had a pretty ideal upbringing, and he was, like, the ideal son. Like, he got good grades. He never did anything bad. He played sports, and he had a lot of activities. He had a lot of friends. And by all accounts, he was just like this super normal, super popular, really high achieving kid. When did he turn dark? <laughs> well, I guess we're going to find out. Uh -huh. um, he played the trombone at Wichita South High School, which is pretty cool, playing the trombone. Trombone. Yep. And when he graduated high school, um, he went to the University of Missouri in Kansas City and graduated from an undergraduate program there. And then he went on to the same university to graduate from their school of pharmacy. And that was back in 1975. Awesome. Yeah. So he's... He was on a really good he's path. He's on a roll. He's on a great path, man. Um, he liked Kansas City so much that he decided to stay there. And he began working at like some smaller local pharmacies, like some privately owned ones for a number of years. And then he was moving on to some bigger chain pharmacies right. that were in the area. Right. And he was making like a decent income and he had a comfortable job, but he never really felt like he had the power that he wanted. He felt like you spent a lot of time like in school. What kind of power was he hoping for as a pharmacist? Well, he, he felt like he spent a lot of time like in school and he right. wanted to, you know, he... He became, we're going to see that he became very greedy. And I don't know what the turning point was for him, but huh. like literal greed was, was the only thing on his mind. Money. Like, a pharmacist is, is a wonderful profession and, oh, it's, and it's a very highly respected career path. It's actually, and it's thought, well, and it's yeah. well paid. 
So yeah. I'm thinking this is an excellent, excellent path for someone to choose. Hmm. But I'm thinking, what power do you want? Like, what you know what right. I mean? Like, like what power? The power I, part gets right. me. I'm like, well, what did you? I don't, I don't right. get it. And you know, I, I I don't claim to understand it completely either because yeah. I really don't. But I do know that it what it seems like is that he kept like switching jobs and kind of climbing the ladder and going to different places, wanting to be sort of higher up in the food chain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seems like all he, at the end, when we find out exactly why he did this and how, it's, right. it becomes very apparent that all he really cared about was money. So It's the root of all evil. It really is. So, um, now, in the 1980s, in the early 1980s, he began working for Research Medical Center in Kansas City. Um, and it was like this big medical facility with like a big tower and they had a pharmacy on the first floor. So he worked there in the research medical tower pharmacy. And there is where he served inpatient and outpatient populations. And one of his biggest responsibilities was preparing and mixing intravenous drugs and solutions for, um, the chemotherapy suite in a neighboring oncology practice. And, and so let's just point out like, this is obviously life-saving medicines and treatments that he's preparing oh yeah like, so chemotherapy is no joke no god no and there's so much involved when mixing chemotherapeutic agents because the drugs and the doses and the fluid ratios are often tailored to patients very specific needs um so this was not just like a you know you take a bottle of you know and then reconstitute it right. and mix it in some fluid there's it's a a lot more is involved with mixing chemo drugs, which is why you need a pharmacist to do it. So just on, as a side note, his love life through all of this was pretty like tumultuous. So he was married like a few times. So he met his first wife um, around the early eighties around this time. And he divorced her years later in 1992. They did have two daughters and he actually retained custody of them. So I couldn't really find oh. exactly what happened, but that's unusual. Usually yeah. the courts lean more I mean, towards the there mom. There had to be something significant. There had to be something mom. that that happened. So um, he had a second marriage then that lasted five whole days. What? So he annulled that marriage. So I don't know if they After just like went days? and got drunk in Vegas and got married okay. or something. Like, there must it have was been, annulled. So like, obviously somebody was yeah. like not in their right mind or under Correct. duress or something. <laughs> so <laughs> his third wife, though, is what like really clicked for him. So Laura Courtney um, is who he married in 1994. And they had a set of twins. And Aww. so he had four kids in total. And it was. Um, during this period, he was serving as the deacon at Northland Cathedral, which is an really? Assemblies of God megachurch in Kansas City. Huh. So he was like this family man. Yes. And he had finally found like his forever wife. Right. He had four kids that he, you know, really cared about. He had custody of his other and two. And a respectable job. And a respectable job. And he was working at this, like, doing this really technical, really important work, getting a lot of it's money. All, it's all working for exactly. him. Exactly. And then again, in, where'd you go dark, dude? Exactly. So um, in 1986, after having worked in this pharmacy for a while, so this is actually before he met his his latest wife. Yeah. Um, in 1986, after working there for a few years, he actually purchased the Research Medical Tower Pharmacy. So he oh. became the owner of the Research Medical Tower Pharmacy. So he was the that owner and operator. Gives him the power he was looking for. Yeah. So now he's like a business owner. You know, Dude. he's a business owner. He's like, this is where I can actually like make some money. You're the boss man. And he's like, I'm going to be my, my, like a boss man. And like, again, by all accounts, this is a nice guy, a family man. And when coworkers found out about what he had been doing all this time, everybody was just absolutely floored, shocked, could not believe it. In 1990, Robert was the owner of this pharmacy and doing a lot of great work with chemo drugs. And he started finding out, though, firsthand, like, how difficult it was to maintain that financial balance when you're operating a business. Right. So pharmacy ownership in, a, in particular is difficult because the drug prices can vary and they're very high. <laughs> yes, they're expensive. And often they increase really quickly. As we all see yeah. on the other side of the counter as we're purchasing our exactly, meds. Exactly, you know? exactly. Because the drugs were making it really difficult for him to sort of find that balance, he sort of started, you know, wondering, like, when am I going to make my big profit? Like, I'm a business owner. I want to, I want to, you know, uh -huh. reap some of these benefits. And he's like, I have to create a wider profit margin somehow. So 
he started looking into cheating the system a little bit of and course. doing things not so Here legally. We go. So in 1990 was when Robert started looking into purchasing pharmaceuticals in cheaper ways, and that led him to the gray market. And so the gray market, we're going to talk about it. The gray market is not to be confused with the black market. Right. Okay, so... Which um, I was just going to bring up. (laughs) The black market typically involves the sale of counterfeit or infringed, like copyright infringed goods. Okay, Um, And the gray market is the trade of a given item or good through distribution channels which are not authorized by the original manufacturer. So the, 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 the product is legit. Right, but the, the product way it's is getting legit. to you and whatnot is illegal. The, well, the legality of selling and buying on the black market, or the, I'm sorry, the gray market, not the black market, the gray market really varies depending on the good that's being purchased. Okay. So some common items that are typically sold on the gray market include video games, computer games, um, uh, game consoles, uh, computers themselves cars and the delivery of media like broadcasting stuff cell phones electronics there's a huge thing for infant formula which seems really weird but apparently it's a big deal because there have been shortages in the past in different parts of the world well, i was gonna say and yeah then, like the, there's a huge recall right now yeah and, and, there, and so there was issues. shortages and exactly so i could see why formula i read yeah. i read something about how years ago there was an infant formula shortage in china that was critical i mean babies right. were like starving and so they, there was a lot of gray market um trade for infant formula yeah i can see that and essentially what that means is that they're getting it they're ordering it from like different countries and different parts of the world So pharmaceuticals, there's a huge market for this. So high popularity and brand name drugs, which can be very, very high cost, Uh are very popular on the gray market. There's a flourishing gray market for pharmaceuticals because drug prices vary so dramatically from country to country. Buyers can purchase, for example, a Canadian-made drug for much less than one manufactured in the U.S. So... This particular thing, buying pharmaceuticals and selling them at a marked up value in a United States pharmacy, that is illegal. Can't do that. Market. It's like market. Exactly. Exactly. So that is definitely illegal. Right. Um, So he would order these gray market pharmaceuticals and use them to fill prescriptions and bill insurance companies the full U.S. market price, leaving him just this massive profit Uh, margin. Yeah. So... After a little bit more time, he was like, hell yeah, I'm like really doing well with this. What else can I do to make sure that I like am making the most money I possibly can? Did he dilute them? Yeah. So He did, didn't he? Greed got the best of him. So If I could take half of this amount, mm-hmm. what's supposed to go into a whole dose? So to further increase his profits, he began taking those chemotherapy drugs and making and other different types of drugs and diluting them. So... What he would do is <sighs> he would use normal saline or sterile water right. to um, aspirate some of the drug for out for later use, replacing the volume with the saline or water. And what would happen is essentially these, uh, the especially, so let's use, for example, the oncology clinic next door would order chemotherapy for somebody. Mm-hmm. And um, he would say, okay, I'll mix it up. And he would print them out a label that says exactly what it is and initial the label and physically bring it over to them in a liter bag of fluid. Right. And it just looks like a liter bag of clear fluid. Uh-huh. I mean, by looking at it, you can't possibly tell I mean, what's mixed when in there. You're, when you're looking at IV bags, yeah, you don't, they all look the they same. They all look the same. Yes. It's clear fluid. Yes. So he brings it over and he says, okay, here's your drug. And then they hang it, they scan it, they uh-huh. hang it. And so what he was doing was splitting these chemotherapy drugs into multiple different bags. Instead of putting one full dose in a bag, he was putting multiple in multiple. And so again, or, I'm sorry, one dose in multiple different bags. Uh, and again, we're talking about chemo. Yeah, chemotherapy. Like, like these people these are people very need sick, it to like survive. desperate to survive. Yeah. So essentially, then the result was obviously the patient not receiving a full dose of chemotherapy when right. they were supposed to. Yeah. So this went on for some years believe it or not before anybody discovered anything i was gonna say because unless you're following like a trail of where he's getting the drugs Mm -hmm. exactly no one initially will know the difference exactly so in 1998 there was this luncheon 
with this pharmaceutical rep from a pharmaceutical company called Eli Lilly. I want to go to a luncheon. I know. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, maybe if you own a pharmacy and have pharmaceutical lunch. reps want to want to sell you <laughs> shit, they'll put on a luncheon for you. <laughs> but this is these are the types of things that happens. So oftentimes, pharmaceutical reps would come around and try to try to sell their drugs to pharmacies. Yeah, they bring and, you pens. And they would bring. Yeah, exactly. That's they bring you pens. Yes. They give you tickets to shows. Yes. They do all that good stuff. So yes. they were having this luncheon, right? Uh-huh. And that same spirit. So this sales rep for Eli Lilly, his name was Daryl Ashley. And have you noticed the men have lady last names? Yeah. Robert Courtney and Daryl Ashley. That's yeah, interesting. Just saying all okay. Right. Second one in the story. I feel like I had to point it out. All right. They're hosting this luncheon for the staff of the pharmacy and the oncology offices. And here, Daryl, the pharmaceutical rep, he he asked Robert Courtney um, about the use of one of their products. Um, and one of their products was a chemotherapy drug called Gemzar. Now, one of the Which nurses... I'm sure is the brand name. I'm yeah, sure that, that is. <laughs> yes. Um, and I think the... All, technical... the other, all the other names are just too hard to pronounce. Yes, exactly. So um, one of the nurses, when she heard that, she piped up and said, oh, we're using tons of that. And that was really interesting to Daryl because when he went back... And he was looking over the data. Um, he didn't. That didn't really jive because there was actually very little of the drug being purchased from Eli Lilly. So, so he's like, "Well, wait a minute." He's like, "Well, if you're using tons of it, then you're not getting you're, it from me." I was going to say my sales should be a lot higher exactly. through the roof than what they are. Exactly. So that. You know, when Daryl, like, dug a little deeper, he found that the pharmacy was dispensing and selling three times the amount of gems are than they were purchasing. Three times the amount. So, so he's like, where the hell are you getting like, it from? where are you getting this stuff? And so an internal investigation was launched. And, and like, with Eli Lilly themselves. And nothing really came of it. They didn't, they didn't really find any illegal activity. So... Dr. Verda Hunter operated an oncology practice on the ground floor of the research medical center and they neighbored. So the pharmacy and her oncology clinic were right next to each other. And so she probably is very familiar with Robert Courtney because he's making up all of her meds. Exactly. So she specialized in ovarian cancer and, um, that and conveniently again the pharmacy who specialized in mixing these chemotherapy drugs was right next to her so that was a very convenient situation for them so she was not at this luncheon that that happened but one of the nurses in oncology reported this little exchange to verda when she came back to the clinic and she she commented that she had heard from the luncheon that Courtney was not getting the, you know, either he was not getting the gems are there or some, there was some kind of discrepancy. And Dr. Hunter found it odd because she had started to notice that the majority of her patients were not as sick from the chemotherapy that one might expect. That was one of the things that I was going to ask. Like, obviously the common Mm -hmm. things from chemotherapy, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, hair loss. Yeah. You know, there, that was like, one of the questions I had in my head. Did anyone yeah. notice that these people aren't So we're going to talk about chemotherapy drugs and sort of how they, how they work and just as a very generalized sort right, of blanket right. statement. Um, there are a great many chemotherapy drugs, and they there's, all have slightly God, different spectrums of use. There's way too many. There's so many. And they all have different slight, like slightly different spectrums of use. Now, used in, on certain cases for, like, many different types of cancer. So the drugs are often taken orally or they're injected intravenously or even subcutaneously. And depending on the type of cancer and the severity being treated kind of depends on the route that you take it. Uh-huh. So chemotherapy drugs work by targeting rapidly dividing cells in the body. So it can actually stop the growth or slow considerably the growth of these rapidly dividing cells, which is great for, you know, getting rid of or decreasing the size of cancer cells. Correct. The problem is that cancer cells are not the only rapidly dividing cells within the body. There Hair are several cells. areas of the body that contain cells. That's the cells. most common one that people well, know that, of. Well, right? that, well, it's mostly like epithelial cells in the oh. GI tract, actually, is, okay. is the big one. Sorry. So, no, this no, is it's why all you're good. the practitioner. <laughs> it's fine. 
<laughs> so there are several areas of the body that, that I contain, think I mean said that one because people yeah people that's often what you can associate see visibly. yeah that and that's what you associate with chemotherapy is right. losing hair Correct. right yes so um, several areas of the body contain cells that have a high turnover rate and most often present in the mouth and gastrointestinal tract so, so our mucus all of them exactly so our mucus membranes are lined with the epithelial cells that turn over really quickly. So that's why this chemotherapy can create so many symptoms within the GI tract. And it can also slow the formation of new cells, which can create a weakened immune system, anemia. It often results in loss of taste, nausea, vomiting, rashes, mouth sores, generalized pain, respiratory issues, easy bruising and bleeding, as well as hair loss. That's why those receiving chemo are very fragile. Exactly. And they, they often lose a lot of weight. And it's a very delicate balance treating cancer because... Yes. Oftentimes the treatment is, you know, it can be very detrimental to you the might, health. You might not feel sick when you're told that you have cancer because exactly. depending on what kind. Right. You're most likely going to feel very sick when you're on chemotherapy. Yes. yes. So Dr. Hunter's clientele included women being treated for ovarian cancer, which is a very aggressive cancer. Scary. And it's often identified in the later stages. So many of these patients were receiving chemotherapy. And she had expected that the chemotherapy drug Gemzar would create you know, a slew of the the symptoms that I just mentioned and yep. changes in their lab work. And everybody was just like feeling pretty well overall. Riding high through their treatment. And while some people might tolerate it better than others, you wouldn't expect everyone, everyone. to Correct. feel good. Correct. You know what I mean? That yep. just really is unusual. Yes, for sure. So initially she wasn't that suspicious because every patient is different and like how they react but to also, the chemo. But once she heard that comment, she was like, hold on. Yeah, really? and I want to know, like, how were her patients doing as far as their cancer? Right, exactly. You know, because they're not receiving what they're supposed to be, so their mm -hmm. cancer's obviously probably exactly. either not, not, it's not going improving, in the right but it's either stalled or per right. still progressing. Exactly. So Dr. Hunter, because she couldn't really get out of her mind that little comment from the luncheon, uh -huh. um, called that Eli Lilly rep, Daryl, and he confirmed that Dr. Hunter's office was purchasing way more gems are from the pharmacy that the pharmacy was purchasing from the wholesaler. So either one of two things were happening. So either the pharmacist is getting the drug from a different source or something else is in the chemo bags that right. is being mixed. So And obviously you want to think in the initial phases of course. that it's something legit of and course. it's being purchased somewhere else. Exactly. So Cuz who goes to the bad thing right away? Exactly. Right she's she's hoping for the best, but she has her suspicions because of how well everyone is doing like physically. Right. So Yes, that is a big suspicion. You know factor. what I mean? So she decides to take a drug, a bag of a another chemo drug that she had on hand called Taxol that was prepared by the pharmacy. And she sent it out of with her own dime to a lab to get chemically tested to confirm the contents of the bag. Not a girl. So this lab was over in Pennsylvania, and it came back in early June of 2001 that the IV bag only had half of the prescribed Stop. dose of Taxol. Yes, the rest was she just... She flipped her shit. Oh, she I, must have. I should hope so. <laughs> she immediately called her lawyer, who contacted the FBI. And she suspected that Courtney was diluting the drugs for the financial benefit. Now, why did she do that drug and not the Genzar one? Well, I think she didn't have any on hand at the time. She okay. had tax all handy. Um, yeah, so yeah, she decided yeah, yeah. to okay. send that out. Yeah. So this became like a top priority for the FBI due to the scale. And initially they kept the investigation pretty quiet, but they knew that they had to move really fast because every day this guy is mixing drugs for people and people are getting half or a third of the doses that they needed right and the thought of a pharmacist or any health professional but especially a pharmacist doing yes. such a thing and with a doctor like if you could if, if you were suspecting them of doing something wrong there's you know there's patients that are all connected to them but like this a pharmacist is connected to many facilities oh, many yeah. doctors you know they're absolutely the realm of who they could hurt and you know pharmacists larger. are among if not the most trusted professional in the world yeah like more so than doctors and nurses yes you know you you trust your pharmacist to give you the right yes. shit you know what i mean has anyone ever out there questioned like why does my pill look different than when it normally does when you're picking up your regular monthly subscription oh, yeah. and be yeah. like wait i usually get a little circle yellow pill yeah i know now why what's is this going one? on and, yeah exactly i mean exactly things change but again you always question that exactly you always do so 
it was really far-fetched to believe that this guy was doing this on purpose initially because of that. Oh, my dog's barking. So sorry, everybody. Now, initially they were like, could this guy just be miscalculating these doses? Could this just be like a mathematical error of some kind? Right. Um, And are we sure that this is on purpose? Because if it is, you know, this is a friggin' huge deal. Again, got to prove. Prove the, the intent. And, exactly. Yeah. So the FDA got involved in the investigation as well. So Dr. Hunter submitted seven additional drug bags for testing that were all mixed by the pharmacy. And these tests all confirmed that only a fraction of the prescribed dose was present in these bags. And as little as 15% of the oh! doses. People are like barely getting anything. Yep. It's ridiculous. And and the highest concentration that they found was only 39% of a dose. Not even half. Not even half. Isn't that insane? Uh-oh. So the investigators believe that Courtney was taking what was supposed to be one dose and splitting it into at least three doses. So having already purchased the drug at a much lower rate from the gray market, he was supposed to be preparing infusions, which could have cost upwards of $3,000 a piece. Ooh. But Chemo only drugs a, are not cheap. They are not. But the cost to him was only about 700 bucks a bag. So that is a massive profit. Can you imagine? Over 2,000 bucks a piece. Oh, yeah. So the evidence was mounting against him because they had all of these Uh bags that were obviously diluted. So the FBI and the FDA then had to determine the chain of custody that a given drug goes through before it reaches the customer after it leaves a pharmacist. Right, there's steps. Right. So there were no other pharmacists present in the building. He was like the only one during this time. And what they did was they persuaded Dr. Hunter to help them with, like, the little sting operation. So Dr. Hunter sent in a bunch of prescriptions for fictitious patients from her clinic. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Courtney mixed the bags in the pharmacy. He he printed the labels. He put the labels on. He initialed the infusion bag on the label or the the infusion label on the bag. Excuse me. And he carried them personally over Dr. Hunter's office. And the FBI took the bags, and they were tested in the FDA lab, and every single bag was substantially diluted. Mm. And they all contained less than 30% of the prescribed doses. Makes it even so suspicious where he's the owner. You oh, know yeah, what I mean? And exactly. And he's personally hand-delivering them. Yes, exactly. It makes it down to, okay, it's not an employee pharmacist that's mixing it, and then a courier right. is taking it over. Exactly. You know, he brought them over. So other... they know that there was no other way that and these bags got diluted. And his initials. Exactly. That the conflict of interest of the profit would go to the owner, which is him. Exactly. Yeah. So this uh, was exactly what they needed, essentially, yeah. to confirm that there was no other um, unit involved. So on August 13th of 2001, the FBI raided the Research Medical Tower Pharmacy. And Courtney greeted them, having no clue what was happening, because, right. again, this was kept pretty quiet. quiet. Yeah. Uh, the FBI told him, oh, we're investigating some diluted chemotherapy drugs, and we and um, can like, you tell oh, me who shit. prepares all the chemotherapy? <laughs> and Courtney immediately states, well, I do. I prepare them. So he, like, unwittingly admitted mm-hmm. to, mm-hmm. like, all the wrongdoings. So the following day, the agents told Courtney about their extensive investigation into him and that he was the target and his pharmacy was closed down. Yep. So on August 15th, two days later, a warrant was issued for Courtney and he turned himself over to the authorities, admitting to diluting all of the drugs. So immediately Kansas City is like in a panic because of this guy, right? Right. They're starting to hear what he's doing. So cancer patients began panicking whom whom had received the chemo. They're like, what? This is my life. Exactly. So the FBI started encouraging anybody who had received chemo at the facility to like reach out to them, reach out to their chemo provider so that, you know, things could get figured out. Oh, I'm sure those poor oncologists were inundated. Uh, Can you imagine? Yeah. My God. So... Initially, he only admitting admitted to diluting drugs over the past few months, which was absolute bullshit. Bologna. He had been doing it for a lot of years. So Courtney gave investigators a list of three medications that he diluted and a list of 34 affected patients. Again, this was bullshit. It, right. it was on a much bigger scale. So on How August... How that out? What's that? How'd they find out that it was on a much bigger he scale? He admitted it later he on. Did. yeah. So August 23rd, 2001, Courtney was indicted on 20 counts of tampering with consumer products and adulterating and misbranding drugs. So when the FBI and FDA believed he was essentially a serial killer, 
um, federal prosecutors, you know, thought about the possibility of like, well, these people who have deteriorating clinical conditions and worsening cancer, is there like a charge that we could bring to him? Yeah, yeah. So it would be impossible to come by, though, because... You have a to lot prove of these people that it was because of the drug exactly drug. and a lot of these people suffered from late stage cancer and mm-hmm. how can you prove beyond a reasonable doubt right. that it was that the, the diluted chemotherapy was directly contributing to their because we know death. even if it was the full dose it might right. not have stopped anything but i mean i i can't imagine that this did not result in many many deaths Obviously. you Obviously. know and totally many people not getting better yeah clearly played a part so even though they couldn't charge him, um, he was named the defendant in approximately 300 wrongful oh. death suits. So there were 300 people that could potentially have survived, survived had they gotten the chemo that they needed. Yeah. So facing the prospect of life in prison, if convicted at trial on February 20th, 2002, Courtney pleaded guilty to 20 federal counts of tampering and adulterating the chemotherapy drug. Taxol and Gemzar. And he also acknowledged that he and his corporation diluted drugs, conspired to traffic and stolen drugs, and caused the filing of false Medicare claims. <sighs> so a plea deal a plea deal ensued to get to the bottom of how long he had actually oh. been doing this because all of these wrongful death so did suits he get are out. Easy? So it turns out that from nineteen ninety two to two thousand one Courtney had diluted 98,000 prescriptions Stop. from 400 different doctors. See, that's what I was saying. The pool is much larger. Oh, yeah. And this was pharmacist. given to approximately yes. 4,200 patients. Oh, my God. So, Courtney admitted to diluting the 72 different types of drugs. Besides the chemotherapy treatments, he admitted to diluting medications for diabetes, like insulins, so no- AIDS, AIDS medications, and fertility treatments. Oh. I know. How crazy is oh. this? So he subsequently admitted that he had been diluting drugs for his entire career, as he put it. <laughs> whatever Fucker. I could. He said, quote, whatever I could dilute, I did dilute, end quote. Fucker. I know. On December 5th, 2002, Courtney was sentenced to 30 years in federal prison. Good. And he had not been. Not enough, but I good. know. It's not enough. So. He was transferred a few times from prison to prison. Currently, he resides at Englewood Federal Correctional Facility, which is in Littleton, Colorado. Littleton. Littleton. So in July 2020, Courtney was considered for release seven years early due to no. the COVID-19 pandemic. Stop yes. it. Yes. No. Yeah. So he would have served the remainder of his sentence under house arrest in Trimble, Missouri, in his request for early release, this, like, chaps me so hard. No. So in in his request for early release, he cited numerous health issues, like, I've had a stroke and I have hypertension. Wah. and Do you have cancer? And, well, here's the thing. And he said, like, my crimes, like, weren't directly violent. And he, he put out this whole thing about how he was, like, essentially too good to I be. I call bullshit. Yeah. Isn't that ridiculous? Wow. So the federal judge... Judge um, Ortry D. Smith turned down that request immediately yes. on September 1st, 2020. So he didn't get out. Saying that his crimes were va- were indeed vastly different than a lot of the other inmates, but that they were a million times worse. He should have totally taken a different route. A hundred percent. Again, I didn't want him to get out. So he uh, did not get out. crimes was not the exactly. right choice. He did not get out. So um he uh, essentially said hell to the no to that, and hit now his earliest possible parole date is 2027. Good. Yeah. Good. Still too early. It's still too early, but good. So this is just to, like, put in perspective the scale um, and the amount of money that he swindled by oh, doing God. this How to much? people at people's medical expense. So over the course of his career, he earned over $19 million. Oh. And by the time he was incarcerated, he had an estimated net worth of $18 million. Wow. He's a millionaire and people are probably figuring out how they can pay for their chemotherapy drugs. Yeah. And he's just fucking rolling in and it. He, oh. He's a monster. But he doesn't get any of that, right? No. God, no. no. His assets yeah, are frozen. So, like frozen. Absolutely but even not. If, even yeah. if and when he gets out, like they're gone. Yeah. 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 Totally gone. So. Be broke, dude. That's, like, really upsetting. Um, And that is the really frustrating story of Robert Courtney, the dickhead pharmacist who probably killed, like, 300 people because he was fucking greedy. 
sit in jail and rot. I hope Dude. he rots, and I hope he has I hope he a few COVID more strokes. While he was in there. I hope he does. Um, I did listen to a podcast from Cast called The Opportunist, who did a four part series on this, and it is awesome. Um, and also, American Greed, which is a CNBC series, um, did a piece on him entitled Deadly Prescription for Greed, which was Whoa, really informative. That's a good title. So if you guys want to check those out for more information, you can. But I'm enjoying listening to other podcasts that are related to the stories that we tell. It's I know, been isn't it neat? To it's a neat, it it's neat to have like a different perspective on what's yeah, going on. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. Yeah. This was a shorty but a goodie. It's a shorty but a goodie. Shorty but a goodie. Sometimes it's nice to have some varying lengths of things, you know, if you only have a little bit of time. I like that we've been able to touch upon, like, all these different... Um, entities of healthcare. Oh, I agree. And I'm about to go to the dentist, so I hope they're not like Glenn and Englewood. Oh, I hope they're also I also hope they're not an a hitman, an actual hitman. Maybe I'll have my own story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you do. If any of you cats and kittens want to drop us a follow on Instagram at Medcrimes Podcast, you can send us a Twitter at Medcrimes BC. You can search us on Facebook, Medcrimes Podcast, or if you wish to become a Patreon, feel free to visit www.patreon.com slash Medcrimes Podcast. See you next time, everyone. Hasta la vista, baby. Baby. We love y'all.